And I now introduce Michael Mejia, who will start us off tonight with the introductions. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thanks to everybody for being here tonight for the last uh, reading of the year. Um, always a favorite uh, because we get to, see, uh, you know, just sort of see uh, what, everybody's been, what everybody's been doing and uh, really experience the smorgasbord of, uh, of work. So, uh, again, thanks. Thanks for being here. Um, thanks to Sadie and Aaron for all the great work you've done this year. It's um, really been a fantastic series and I uh, really appreciate it. And, if, and again, thanks to, to Finch Lane as well for hosting. Um, okay, so we have a slightly different lineup uh, or sort of approach this year since um, we were only going to have three people uh, uh, reading. And that felt like, you know, great on the one hand, but also maybe reach out and see if the people who are not on campus would uh, participate in some way. So we have videos from them. Uh, and typically we would go in alphabetical order, if you know this, uh, uh, this reading. Um, but we're kind of shaking that up a little bit too, because otherwise all the videos would end up at the end, and that would be weird. So um, we're going to start, uh, we have another, another sort of new thing. We have Rick uh, Barrett, who will start off uh, for us. You know, this is where we are going in, in alphabetical order. Um, so we're going to start with Rick. Rick's joining us. Uh, he's had a great semester here. It's really been um, an honor and, and, and uh, so much fun to have you and, and get some time to spend with you. And, and um, you know, I know the, the students have been, been really happy with you as well. So um, very happy to introduce Rick Barrett uh, to start off uh, the reading for tonight. Hi, everybody. How's the sound? Can you hear me? OK. So I have felt so welcome during my time here, and I want to thank all of you very much for, for that. Um, one of the highlights for me this winter was to finish a new book of prose poems. And I'm going to read a few of those poems tonight. I'm strangely nervous right now. I think it's, you're such a discerning room. OK. The first poem is called Capilano. And that word refers to the place in British Columbia where this poem is set. Capilano. The rain is the sound of geology breathing. I stop and close my eyes for a long moment and listen to it hitting the tree's canopy, an ancient percussiveness. Your voice ahead of me says something I can't comprehend. Your voice that inside my closed eyes becomes an image of the lime raincoat you are wearing. Each thing dissolves into something else, the mist drifting like white hair underwater, the weather becoming an ecstasy. We walk across a narrow suspension bridge slung over a gorge. The river thrashes like a green snake below. Among the trees, you make bird calls that sound like hurt birds. You keep wanting to climb the cliffs, testing their little holds, their fissures cleaved by water and by ice. In time, I have come to comprehend this, that you believe in the world by touching its every face. You walk in front of me, and I, like a figure in a myth, I obey. How many of you remember a movie from maybe 20 years ago uh, called Central Station? Is this ringing a bell? This is uh, inspired uh, by that movie. This is called The Terminal. I want a face like a man who sets up his small table, chair, and worn typewriter in a corner of the bus terminal in the center of the enormous city and types the letters of the illiterate. They stand next to him in a posture of awkward confession, carefully giving him the words. They pay him by the sheet and for the stamp on the envelope and for the envelope. Because they cannot read what is on the page after the letter is finished, they do not know about the mistakes he makes and let's go without correction. 
or the, correction he, the corrections he makes to their grammar. He has done this for many years, near the man who polishes shoes, near the woman who sells boiled peanuts. His face is as placid as a god's, affixing a category to each letter. Money, infidelity, illness, despair, longing, gossip, grief. The way that we identify saints by the things that tortured them. This next poem is called For Amina. And this is an homage to uh, a wonderful writer who I really love, a fiction writer named, named Amina Kane. And if you don't know Amina's work, you really should get to know it. For Amina. Right into the smudge in the painting where the pink lays into the green. Right into the plush of his lower lip right into the light pouring from the oculus above the Baroque courtyard, right into the whippoorwill that sings each morning, bringing in the morning. The two old balloons caught in the branch outside the fourth floor window, the sky in its gray flannel suit, right into the person practicing scales but practicing them out of order, right into the honey, the story he told about the hierarchies of honeybees, the story he told about the man mummified in honey, right into his white hands, right into the smell of pomade, right into the smell of August, a thug of a smell right into each trivial but astonishing trick, like roller skating backwards or snipping thread with your teeth, right into the rain, right into its fall, knowing that the only God you can know is gravity. This is the last piece. And the title of this piece is Four Minutes, 33 Seconds. And that might ring a bell for some of you because this is inspired by that piece by John Cage, wherein a pianist on the stage sits at the piano not playing anything for four minutes and 33 seconds. Four minutes, 33 seconds. Once in a class I took, the teacher told us to write down everything that came to mind in the four minutes and 33 seconds of silence that she gave us, common yarrow, sheep sorrel, chocolate lily, stone crop, I stood beside you as you set your phone before each thing, and the app gave us their names. When my father died, I was told grief was a kind of map that would require the work of navigation, but grief was not like this. There was no path, no terrain I recognized. What I knew of the map was the unreachable, unreadable ocean. Is there something after there is nothing left to say? Maybe this, that everything has been said before, over and over, but now it must be said again in the vernacular of the present. You bind your hands with blue wraps before boxing. You wear, a white, you wear a white bow tie patterned with staves and notes. You are as thin as cinnamon. You are as radiant as water. Thank you all for listening. I'm just going to read a couple of two, two quick prose pieces. Um, 
They're based in the style that I've been writing that we call the Chronica, so I'm just going to read two Chronicas, and they are these sort of, kind of, um, it's sort of similar to prose poetry, except I don't consider myself a poet, I'm not a poet. Um, and yeah, they don't really cohere together narratively, they're almost like a cross between, say, flash fiction, prose poetry, and a little bit of just like lyrical, creative nonfiction. Um, it's based on a kind of Portuguese or South, or or Lucifone form, um, yeah, but I hate it when people just spend way too long setting up stuff, so I'm just going to read it and let the chips fall with me. Um, okay, hope you guys are doing well, and uh, yeah, see you in the fall. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, Chronicle de Cor. It's impossible to find a poet in the poetry world who would like your poetry if you tell them you do not like theirs. Diane Wachowski forms an extension of content. So, once more, with attitude, I'm not a poet. Ballad of the Policeman, after Lee Perry. Uniformed in broad daylight, militia rights in a dim light, white hood and moonlight, civil, service, civil servant at sunrise. I've seen the best minds of my generation, desperate to get teaching jobs, only to discover that many treat the profession like nothing short of a glorified form of customer service. And of course, by many, I mean parents, students, and administrators. People say that I've gotten fat, but what they don't realize is that I've been putting on weight for my upcoming role as a middle-aged failure. Southside Chicago name, Ron with a hard R. Dating app name, moderately attractive. Don Barclame, deep cut name, Blaufox. Diva name, Ne Plus Ultra. My middle name, Cash Money. Dirty South name, Ham Hock Sandwich. Borscht Belt name, Shecky Tannenbaum. High School Heartthrob name, Mayor McRiz. The earworms, the whispers, the spinners, and the shock of recognition. All that, and I've yet to make mention of one going to solo. Question. What did the fresh plum say to the dried plum? Answer. Don't be such a prune. Impetus. Kids, ha ha ha. But don't try this at home. I know I make it look easy, but these jokes don't dad themselves. <laughs> then there's the fact that in this age of instant accessibility, of having a trove of knowledge and scholarship literally at one's fingertips, few care to want to live with Flaubert's disease. They believe that a slew of inexact words, a misplaced modifier, or absent comma is acceptable, passable, not a big deal because, hey, they got their point across. In essence, they choose mediocrity, disdain literary for the easy pleasures of providing content. Truth be told, I'm not all that worried about artificial intelligence ever writing something comparable to what I do, especially when writing the Chronica. After all, my insistence on eschewing emotional connections in art not only makes me better, but makes me a better robot before the fact. Or, to put things another way, 01000101010100000100. I'm mad at my desk and I'd be writing all curse words, expressing my aggression through my schizophrenic first words, the Beastie Boys. Multiplicity reigns supreme, further evidence of my fractured, fragile, fractal life. So yes, Virginia, there are deliberate allusions to the works within the works. But every now and then, I fall apart. And here's a six-word story meant to sear itself into your brain. For Christ's sakes, pay me already. <laughs> a pregnant pause, an unlikely inversion, reflection before the humble brag du jour. Isn't that always the way of those who do nothing but what they continue to be told can't be done? Yo, enough respect to super hot fire. Enough respect. But check it. They call me form, content, stands a man. Form, to keep within tradition. Content, to show y'all how to invigorate tradition. And stands up, because I can so. But I'm not a poet. <laughs> One may think me conservative, but I believe that sometimes the old ways work best. Therefore, if you show for me, I will show for you. Let there be no doubt about it. Past name I'm not supposed to tell you. 
Leroy Louis Cans. Street nerd name, I roll 20s. Yiddish name, Mori Chachka. Name I just said, crit, crit, 20. Late 1980s Pacific household, Pacific Northwest hothead name, Punky Brewster. Name that kept people housebound in 2020, Dat Rona. 2021 variant name, O Micron. Name of the thing I write, Hits. And in the name, in the holy name of Kali Jesus Christ, yes is Isis. When I first heard Three Feet High and Rising, I was not ready to be so ready. And yet, these days it seems like everywhere I go is there but for the grace of God. So when this is all over, come find me on the banks of the river Letha. There I'll be drowning, and perhaps even drowning my sorrows. Just muddy waters, and surly daughters, and me. Chronica for Colorado. Fifteen years after the fact, I think I've achieved peak grad student, bearded, devoted to spouting malformed ideas based upon misunderstood philosophy, in a state of perpetual bachelorhood, and always already worried about my finances. So, let's put on the classics and we'll have a little dance, shall we? I'm not a narcissist, I just happen to believe in lots of self-care. Alas, it's because we spend so much time policing ourselves, falling prey to respectability politics, social justice politics, racialized politics, to the political morass of what one's politics represent. It's only in our most secret spaces do we feel free to just be. Thus, in an act made of equal parts rebellion and self-preservation, there will be no image here, mainly because to adopt an image is all one expects of us. Knock knock who's their name, fuck around and find out. Midnight name, hey girl. Name on the fence, dither him and haw. Name that bears repeating, bush weed, corn, trash. Name before I got kicked out of the armed forces, Captain Kvetch, bobsled name, cool runnings. Name that fortifies me, roast fish, cornbread, maca. Bandouche, what do you name, Kelly Belfest. Once more, but a bit more butch, Beaufeche. Name anyone who has ever tried to talk to me at a crowded party can attest, ADHD. Name that signifies a postmodern narrative, homo fictitious. Name that supports a Republican majority, racism. Name that's nothing but good times, kid dynamite. They say you pay the cost to be the boss, so why can't I get receipts? And yet, and now's as good as time as any to introduce an and yet, here's what some fail to see. The secret of the form is that it contains a meaning well beyond its referent. That's the genius of the Chronica. It's in the G building, taking all types of medicine. You think your form is better than? My favorite color, righteous umbrage. It's all the rage amongst the French. And well, since everyone seems to know everyone that is but me, just what makes this a, bra a black piece of prose? It took time, a long time, but eventually when she cried, she learned to cry feathers. So many that they soon stuck to her body and she was able to fly away. But I'm not a poet. Memories of imagined experiences, past lives like vestigial limbs. They keep saying slavery was a long time ago and I should just get over it. But tell that to my telomeres. Of course, it was Octavia Butler who taught me, drowning people sometimes die fighting their rescuers. Once more, with feeling, Woe to the man of education who belongs to no crowd. Even his uncertain little successes will be held against him, and the higher virtue will condemn him, even as it robs him. Stunned all, red and black. It's a shame, really, that in this, the 24th year of our 21st century, there are still writers who devote more care and attention to their social media accounts than they do the editing of their prose. Go on, then, I guess, in your attempts to shill. Graffiti art, art world crossover name, sunk cost. LA County Museum of Art name, Matt Glossy, name that was this close to making it, Minor Jackson, Old Nazareth name, <laughs> I-R-N-I, -I. name that's ride or die, let's do this, name that just gets it confused, they dudes, German expressionist name, Mit Phelan, Uber name, Travis, Bick Travis Bickle, early 60s French colonial name, Ron de Gaulle, new Negro name, Locke Thurman, name when I watch you cook, 
Uncle Roger, always a biblical bridesmaid name, Ron the Baptist, Frankfurt Book Fair bullshit name, Price Booker, Wild Frontiersman name, maybe Crockett. And if I refer to myself with the phrase I barely understand, like Malu Boy, does it make it any less racist? Task of the day. We must decide if the following statement is true or false. Quote, despite the best efforts of generation, my identity has never been wrapped up in my race. End quote. Please limit answers to 300 words or less. They say that respectability politics is a myth, but just last night, I was reminded of just how bad things had gotten and just how bougie I had become. Again, but this time with style. It's not a neologism, it's a lifestyle choice. Thanks everybody, be well, bye, ciao ciao. Always, <laughs> it didn't blow up. Um, always my second favorite reading of the year. My first favorite one being the graduate student reading in the fall. I am just um, mostly rearranging the chairs in a new poetry manuscript right now, adding some new chairs, which means I have to rearrange them all again. Um, and it's, it's called Time and Change. The first section is physics, of course. Um, uh, natural creatures and um, art. I'm not reading any of those. Second section is elegies for my parents and also for a number of my teachers who were in my parents' generation, which means they're all pretty much gone. Not reading any of those. You can count yourself lucky for, <laughs> for that. And uh, then the last section is really about what it is to experience time and change in a body. Uh, and these poems are from that section. Um, some of them, the titles just go straight into the poem, so don't be alarmed. One day I woke up and knew my body had been colonized by bats. It had given itself over to an idea somehow involving the long haul. Not overnight, it came in fits and starts and then was there. You can't imagine how young I was, how little I knew what I was doing, much less my body. Decades later, my body hiccuped and sneezed and blew its pipes clean. The bats fluttered their own ways into the dark. It felt like that, air cleared like a throat. Whew. And I could see land and sky meet, the vanishing point restoring me to myself. All that time in between, who knows, who knows who I was? What if I thought I thought I was doing? A um, couple of sonnets. Near dawn, I dreamed of capitalism and woke up smelling like sugar, dampish, still smaller than I feel. Was I turning into one of those little old ladies we call sweet because they sport fanciful sneakers and hide stilettos in their tote bags? Mine sharpens up an edge, fine and whispery, a feather you would hardly feel drawing your sternum open. What you don't know, don't trouble your head about. No worries. Forget it's even there. Beauty ignites, so you wanted to be incandescent yourself, or worshiping, give your all to the flame, kindling it with old papers, then pages from your favorite books torn free, plots, poems, ideas tossed and flown, then chair legs, the best table, the bed. Why not throw money right at it, singles, tens, ghosting into ash? As long as you feed it, it is too bright to see. Before the fire dies, it burns you blind. If I could learn to love my mistakes, T. 
too late for that. Oh, well. Meanwhile, the road to hell paves itself. The errors belong to me, whatever I may have meant back then. Retard, again, again. So um, some of you know that I keep clothing for a very long time. I'm, I'm not a Marie Kondo kind of person. And when I'm tired of something, uh, I try to buy good enough clothes that I can sort of let it go to the back of my closet. And then 10 or 15 years later, when I have nothing to wear, I'll dig around back there and I'll come out with something and think, oh, OK. Um, but there's one article of clothing that has been with me for 50 plus years. Uh, it's the brand of blue jeans that I started wearing when I was 13. And most of you have never seen me in them, but I've always had two pairs uh, at a time um, since that time. You haven't seen me in them because they're not quite appropriate for work wear. Um, and uh, they're Levi's 501 shrink to fit jeans. So some of you will know what those are, and some of you won't. Um, this poem is an ode to the 501s, but it takes its title from the original name of those jeans, which is Levi's Original Waist Overalls. 83 years after their invention, you sat your ass right down on the sidewalk and left days between washings, weeks. Your defense being you didn't wear them against bare parts, but you did. Sometimes all of them all day, and the fabric took on your body's shape and motion. What might rub here and touch there, swell or undo you over decades. If another half century on, you become smoother, more decorous, they do by the same degrees, and you don't notice your limp, limp coming on or side hitch list, or even a late straightening out, we can hope. Still fading, thinning, softening where you work them, they fray into their best selves until you reach the day you can't live hard enough to wear them out, their knees and seats unspent, threads indigo, and anything but bare. I see Barry. Barry's the only person in this room who's seen me in a pair of 5 <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to out you on that, Barry. <laughs> um, and I'm going to end with, uh, with this poem. It's called Furies. They never worked out how to manage their hair, which hissed and coiled whenever the wind blew. That was a long time ago, and we've invented solutions, mooses and pomades, or just buzz cut the vipers. No more too many minds of their own, each spitting fire and going its own way. Don't ask why vengeance is female. You should know. If only they'd had professional quality clippers, and the god of the underworld hadn't loved them like girls begotten out of too much power and fear of the sun. Fury might mean a habanero ice cream with bitter chocolate and salt, delicious and not too crazy hot to be sweet. But I doubt it. poems from Paisley. The first one is called Art. Heart. I remember the boy who called me dirty and the French women who hissed pauvre petite as I passed on the street. And I remember the girl like me at school who pasted her face with white paint and blacked her brows to pass, she said, as Mexican. I remember everything for which I was made to feel ashamed. Even the fact my father said I would never make half the woman my mother was because of my heart, which the doctor now calls unusually large. Memory is the weakness I bear on my own. 
I come from a race on my mother's side said to be the most stolid and insensible, yet feels so keenly alive to suffering. It hurts to hear the words strangers use for Chinese shopkeepers, or watch the Chinamen here laugh when I say I am of their race. I, who but for a few phrases remain unacquainted with my mother tongue. I have the name my English father gave me, and I look like my father. I could be loved if I lived as if I were like him, too. But I prefer the name I have invented for myself. I want the world to see my mother in me, regardless if the Chinese have no souls. I do not need a soul. It is not my soul in question here, in these hot glances, these furious whispers. Why care for love when I do not know if I should love others in return? Love is a white loneliness that swells the heart and shuts me out from pleasure. What is there for one like me to do but wander, a pioneer traveling between west and east, myself the link they threaten to destroy between them. I do not need a name on legal papers. Here is a match. Here is the mirror in which my pale face burns its flickering allegiances. My soul is everywhere on my person. I lose nothing of myself that has not already disappeared. Heroic, Helen Holmes, The Hazards of Helen. Victim, tie me up to trestle or bridge, I bristle, buck, saw through blunt bindings, swing and shimmy to ease myself down burnished poles, bold, cold, heroic. Lock me inside your clerk's closet, I'll pick its double lock, duck the huckster's ill-timed shot, tackle robbers in the boxcar. Intrepid, I ride astride slender waist rails, uncouple cars, and mount runaways. I turn all tales to heads, begin each film fired, despised, till I solve all crises I alone saw coming. I get my men. My fans are manifests now of different destinies. The West is a dead end for those with frailty inbuilt to their machinery. Men here hit the skids, lost it all on stocks, cows, cards, slots, topped out and constrained by history. But I'm still speculative, exciting, my amplitude, the endless futurity to which my sex has always been traveling. That's why strangers eat me up in the dark, laugh when I grab the robber's mitt, the one snatching at your heartstrings, my leather believes. Now I bring my mouth down to his wrist to take a bite that only looks like a kiss. What day? <clears throat> On this seventh day of the seventh month, magpies bridge in a cluster of black and white, the Sky King crosses to meet his queen time tracked by the close-knit wheeling of stars. I watch. You come to me tonight, drunk on wine and cards, nails ridged black with opium to ease the pain of work. We are all men here. Anybody can be a bridge, little raven. Your eyes squeezed shut, but not from pain. We are a trestle, a grade we build together. What matter if you say you'd never choose me were there women willing in this desert? I chose. I choose the memory we share of rivers, your hair of smoke and raw, wet leather. A man in another man's hand makes himself tool or weapon, says the overseer, 
as if a man's use to another is only one of work. Pleasure is the only chosen future. You are the home I briefly make, the country I can return to. Here, where the moon wheels its white shoulder in the dark, and you push me to the earth, slip my whiskered tip of hair into your mouth. Hi y'all, thanks for coming out. Um, I am knee deep in a couple novels. Um, and thus, and I really, really didn't want to read anything sad and they're really sad. So this is, um, this is the beginning of a short story called The Kepler Story and it is my attempt at humor. <laughs> <laughs> so please feel free to laugh, please. Um, this is called The Kepler Story. You're only getting the first eight pages, it's like 30 pages long. This is a story that's easy to tell, but slightly harder to read. It starts like this. A writer writes a book. As she's writing, she's thinking a lot about fathers, fathers who can't live up to, fathers who have mothers with whom they struggle. Maybe this book, she thinks, will be the way she figures out who she is and what she wants and where she needs to go. There's a reason she's interested in fathers, which is that her own is, to her mind, wonderful. She shares drafts of the manuscript with him as she's writing the book. They laugh, and he disagrees with the plot pivots, and she changes them. He approves, and though he would not admit it, he cries at the requisite sad parts, and they agree they both love the book. It's a really beautiful book. That part of the story isn't really up for the debate. It's strange, her father says. Your books before this were so difficult, so hard to understand. They were plotless and interested in language, she tells him. They weren't really telling a story. They were more like very long poems. Her father nods to her then and grabs her hand and pulls it to his chest and sort of messes up her hair, and she says the requisite, Dad, but of course she doesn't mean it. Of course she loves it, and the way he treats her, the, the way he treats her like she is still 10. She loves it because her, sat, her life is lined with all kinds of complicated sorrow, sorrow that is not part of this story. And this gesture of his, it reminds her that once her life was a simpler life, a life that was smaller and safer and full of promise instead of a variety of different kinds of fear. The next day, she sends the manuscript to her editor at the small press that has published her last three books. And 20 minutes later, her editor writes back, this is beautiful but this book's already been published. Her heart, it stalls. What do you mean? The concept, it's already published, already in print. This manuscript you sent me, it's already a book. Her manuscript is about Johannes Kepler and the strange moment in history when his mother was accused of being a witch. It is from the perspective of one of Kepler's sons, Ludwig. The guts of the plot are about a short story Kepler wrote long before his mother was accused of witchcraft, a very short science fiction story that, years later, ended up being evidence in Kepler's mother's trial. Evidence because there were these aspects of the novel that suggested the protagonist was Kepler. The protagonist studies under Tycho Brahe, just like Kepler. The protagonist is an astronomer who determines the precise measurements required and atmospheric conditions it would take for a human to get to the moon, just as Kepler did. The protagonist has a mother who is a witch and, apparently, to those accusing her, so does Kepler. <laughs> it's one of those stories that exhibits slippage between the author, the narrator, and the character. The, the editor summarizes the book that is about to be published, the book that is not hers. It is essentially the same plot and the same uptake. There are even similar themes. Who wrote it? The writer asks her editor. She is pouring herself a very large whiskey, and her editor <laughs> responds with the name of a novelist she loves. It's a novelist she deeply admires, a writer who, frankly, she's not surprised to hear, has found this material interesting. <laughs> Fuck, she thinks, and promptly gets a nosebleed. <laughs> that night, she emails the publishing house scheduled to publish the forthcoming Kepler book to request an advanced copy. It's not out yet, but will be in several months, and so she tells them she wants to review it, and they send her a PDF. The book is brilliant. 
It's superb, she thinks, a rare and stunning book. It is for the ages, and she loves it, and she downs the rest of her whiskey. <laughs> her deepest insecurity is, always has been, being derivative. This situation is the definition of that. She is a writer of fiction. That is her job, to get people into trouble and then get them out. But how, how does she get out of this problem in the real world, the world of tangible conflicts and concrete ramifications? There's a moment in her novel when Kepler is trying to discern what to do about the fact that all the evidence points toward the sun being at the center of the solar system, but only a few people want to believe it. The math is sound, the logic is sound, everything points one toward one conclusion, yet everyone else is finding a way to make their square theories fit around whole. Kepler's writing a letter about this to Galileo, and he looks out his window, and the moon is full, and for a moment, he is filled with awe because in the Western world, for some reason, humans are drawn to things that are round. He looks at the moon, and he thinks about the beauty of a circle. Then he starts thinking about the orbits of the planets around the sun. She calls her father to tell him this whole story, the story of this story, and receive the requisite father pep talk. Screw everyone, you're brilliant, he says. I'm paraphrasing. He is not an artist at all. He is really sort of, to some extent, the opposite of an artist, which means he works in sports. <laughs> this is why he's fantastic at pep talks. <laughs> also, he has this way of using various episodes of Rod Serling's The Twilight Zone to really elegantly and in an understated way, yet also sincere way, say things about life. This situation reminds him of this episode, Six Characters in Search of an Exit, wherein all these strange characters, a ballerina, a mime, a military man, etc., they are all in this kind of atemporal limbo purgatory, and they don't know who they are, and it turns out in the end that they are all merely self-conscious but trapped in static dolls. They're nothing at all. A reference to life struggles using plot summaries from episodes of The Twilight Zone would usually help her, but as she's listening to her father say that this particular episode is an ec excellent example of how life governs through invisible structures, she realizes that the novel she finished before the Kepler novel, the one that was published last year, it could easily be summarized as precisely and exactly the plot of that episode of The Twilight Zone. <laughs> Jesus Christ, she is so derivative she doesn't even recognize it. She is taking stories and recycling them, and she isn't even aware. What is she, she thinks. Who is she? Why is she? She downs the rest of her whiskey as her father goes on and on. Now the fear of not being anyone, of being no one at all, surfaces in a very palpable way. She gets a nosebleed. She tells her father. He reminds her not to tilt her head back, just apply pressure and let the blood flow down. She tells him she loves him and that she has to go. In her novel, there's a scene wherein Kepler is starting to formulate a theory that all celestial objects actually have a soul, have some kind of central animation that drives them, including the Earth. In the scene, he is harvesting berries with his son, Ludwig. This is long before his wife becomes mentally ill, and he's accused of causing her illness because he is a stargazer. It's just him and little Ludwig gathering berries, and Kepler looking at a berry in his hand and believing it is something the Earth has created because the Earth has depth and personality and spirit. And Kepler bends down, and Ludwig sits on his knee, and they eat a berry, and Kepler tells his son that sometimes there's more to the story than what you can perceive. More to the story than what you can experience. Since he, Kepler, he knows about the stars, but he has never been there. There's some things that have to be perceived through a network of sense, senses, not just the eyes. Then they each eat a berry, and Kepler kisses his son on the forehead, and then Ludwig hugs him, like a really long, intense hug that Ludwig will go on to remember for a very long time after his father dies at the age of 60. And they situate themselves so they're looking out over the hills and valleys of grass together and the taste of earth's berries like a memory in their mouth. There's a thin line between obsession and deep critical investment in a single author's oeuvre. Many people have exploited this for tenure. <laughs> what she decides to do is this. Read all of the author who wrote the other Kepler novel. Read all of that author's work carefully, closely, to see where it leads. And in the process, ignore the Kepler novel that she wrote. It's a waste of time in terms of her fiction writing life to abandon a book that's done. But she needs to find a way around this problem, a way of discerning who she is and why. The Kepler book she wrote is a beautiful, she thinks, or rather a beautiful manuscript. 
She figured some things out about herself while she was writing it, and she elegantly, though in an oblique way, folded those revolutions into the narrative. And Kepler himself, the man to her mind, he is sort of a crystallization of everything she truly cares about in this brief and fleeting life. The moon, snowflakes, the history of optics, the way things that seem round are actually elliptical, which you will soon discover has a lot of metaphorical value in large and small ways. So all of this, it's a conundrum. It's a whole web of agon. What she thinks she's going to do is read all of the author's work and allow the author, who to some extent did in fact craft this conflict, I mean, not alone, but there is some blame to lie there, she will, follow, she will allow the author, through her published work, to tell her what to do. I've held off telling you the author. Did you notice? <laughs> her guilt and insecurity is a theme here you're likely picking up on. And it was also a theme in the Kepler book. The son, Ludwig, is insecure about following in the steps of his father, and she was folding in this whole other thread about doors and portals and the history of locksmithing and making these graceful and subtle relationships between locks that fail and insecurity. There is an episode of The Twilight Zone <laughs> in which things start out relatively stable. That is sort of how all stories tend to begin. With these two families playing cards and then agon, there's a conflict. And they have to flee the planet, and they do so via a spaceship. And in the last moment of the episode, as they are safely away and settled into their destination for a better world, the child asks her father where they are headed. It's a planet much like ours, he says. I'm paraphrasing. And then he says the last line of the episode, and that line is this. The name of the planet is Earth. I want to be true to her, to tell you everything, because I have complete access. I want to tell this story so that it's beautiful and haunting and ephemeral and says things in a really accessible, clear way, but also kind of an elegantly coded way so that you get a chance to do some discovering. I want to tell the story so that it is about this network of breathtaking concepts, obsession and insecurity and doors and locks and space and science and stories. But this is fiction, and fiction is supposed to be all about action and event. The author is Rivka Gelchin. <laughs> Thank you. Houston, and at the time I was working on a series of poems about the Skrovenia Chapel in Padova, uh, an early 14th century chapel frescoed by the great Giotto. Um, this poem has a few quotations from Rothko. I think it's pretty clear what they are. I also use the word cheder, which was basically primary school for very religious Jews in Eastern Europe. Uh, for boys, they learned Hebrew, they learned religious texts. Okay, Rothko Chapel. One, no doubt mine is a peculiar vantage point. My head still teeming, will it always be? I hope so. With image after image from the Jonto. Two, but here I'm in Houston for the first time. There is no Giotto, only Rothko. Three, to whose canvases I've warmed over the years, as I've warmed to the vista opened by the felled tree, its dying limbs hazardous in wind, which used to occupy my bedroom window. Leaves, vines, branches, finches, tanagers, replaced by mountain range and gaping sky. No wings, no bird song, instead expansiveness that morphs from blue to mauve to purple gray. Four, which is what I'm expecting as I enter the chapel, completely unprepared for its despair. Five, 14 
canvases, black on black, in a chapel Rothko would never get to enter, having died a year before the building was completed. Barbiturates and razor, suicide. Six, no note, unless one accepts the 14 canvases. Seven, the black variegated, here encased in brown, there restless with near black undulations, like water in motion, think high tide, storm, a lake into which a rock's been thrown, ripples amassing as your eyes adjust to dark, guided by a clouded over moon. Eight, and here, like the ribbon ghosts I once beheld, zigzagging across a pre-dawn sky. Northern lights, someone yelled, and we came running. Only these aren't greenish blue, but gray. Nine, dark, dark gray. Poor Rothko, poor visitors, poor pilgrims seeking solace, poor century that cannot make amends, poor need, poor sorrow, poor loss, poor grace, poor hangers on, cut off by their own hands. 10. In his native Dvinsk, Dogvalis, Latvia, Rothko, then still Rothkowitz, was sent to Cheder on his father's unexpected return, the best translation of the Hebrew noun for a godless Jew's embrace of his religion. 11. There, no doubt, he learned the prohibition on depicting anything on earth in water in heaven. Might this be the reason for the black? 12. Or that most of his classmates were surely murdered? 13. I am fairly certain Rothko never went to Padova. Even if he had, he couldn't have guessed that article I found was not yet written. That the woman cloaked in black is probably the synagogue. And yet, in every canvas, here she is. 14. Who knows how we're shaped by what we've learned. Perhaps a trace of Torah hovers in a recess of this chapel. Perhaps for Rothko, sanctity meant crisis. The God he didn't believe in, the Jewish God, clamoring for nonstop sacrifice, whose prohibition on graven image, I found that figure could not serve my purposes. Rothko had long before internalized. 15. We do know he was a man of principle. Returned the Seagram money after eating in the restaurant for which a series of murals had been commissioned. His canvases, he decided, would not be seen by anyone who'd eat that food at those prices. 16. And though he never saw the Giotto, he loved the Fra Angelico, stuffed with Giotto's scenes, his compositions. But that long tradition, artist refiguring artist, feels for all time suspended here. 17. Or perhaps I'm unresponsive to what figure cannot serve. 18. And there's sublimity invisible to me. Animating each one man reconnaissance mission to an outpost or interstice of black. In what Mark Rothko didn't live to see. time ever I'm last. Um, 
just thank you all again for being here. Um, thanks to Rick and Lindsay and Kate and Jackie and Ron uh, and Paisley uh, for their contributions and for being great colleagues and to all of you for being great students. It's been um, a real pleasure working with everybody this year or for as many of you as I've been able to work with. Um, and I'll finish up here. Um, this is a short piece of fiction. Um, yeah, uh, speaking of being attracted to things that are round and sports, here we go. This is called The Japanese. I watch them every day, the pros. Men, women, I don't care. I just want to see a few points, a few games before I go to bed. The result doesn't really matter to me. I'm watching to see them move, the way they keep their feet active, big strides to short, choppy steps, left to right along the baseline, forward and back, how they defend, how they never take their eyes off the ball, rushing the net, lightening their touch for a drop shot, looping a passing shot down the line. I'm trying to see what they see as they see it, the open spaces, the opportunities. The players I admire most that I'd like to emulate have what I think of as wit. At their best, there's real joy in their game. You see it in the way they glide to the ball, right place, right time, every shot like a question, almost comic, as if to say, did you think of this? How about this or this? All their effort concealed by a calm upper body, a puff of breath as they uncoil, gaze still fixed on the point of contact, even as the ball is already crossing the, next, the net to their opponent's side. Why is it so hard, I ask myself, when I've lost a set to my friend to pay attention? Most mistakes I make I can attribute to letting my eyes drift, taking my mind with them. Such a small but crucial thing, attention. Binding everything together, feet and legs, shoulders, arm and wrist, breath, vision, anticipation, imagination. It's not distraction. I'm not thinking of something else. I'm not somewhere else, the future, the past. It's a momentary loss of control, like the involuntary relaxation of an absolutely essential muscle at precisely the wrong moment. Or maybe I am in the future, knowing how I want the point to end. But as my eyes are traveling to see that, the point is already finishing differently, in the net, out of bounds. It's over before I can fully visualize the ending I was imagining. The day of the incident, I'd actually played well, won the first set, finished even midway through a second before our time ran out and my friend and I had to get back to our respective work. I drove home mechanically, happy with how consistently I'd watched the ball. If I could just do that every time out, if I could do that all the time, everywhere, who would I be? I was still reflecting on this later at the cafe where I go to read and grade papers. I was on the patio making notes when I was overwhelmed by a shout, a cry of distress launched into the sky, blossoming outward on its way, accompanied by a grotesque rending sound back here on earth, like a body being turned inside out, bones cracking and splintering as they separated from muscle, tissue tearing, snapping sinews producing pizzicato tones, organs flopping heavy to the pavement. I heard all this in the wake of that resounding lament as if expelling it with such force could only result in physical obliteration. Had there been an accident? A car plowing into that table closest to the street? My eyes were closed. My whole body had tensed, bracing for more, uh, bracing for more before I looked up, unsure whether this was something I needed to see. Some people at the tables around me were already standing, as disturbed and confused as I was, but it was just two men over there, across from, sitting across from each other. The one closest to me, close enough to touch, was Caucasian. Short, silver hair, severe, steel-framed glasses, chin raised as if he were waiting, awaiting the answer to a question he'd just posed to his companion. A man in a dark linen blazer, hunched over, face in his hands, the other man's thick black hair, like a tuft of spiky grass, quivered as he wept. Two women, a straight-haired redhead and a brunette with curls down to her shoulders, were already approaching, the redhead with a glass of water, the brunette asking the stricken man in a soft voice, are you all right? Then the other man, is he okay? What happened? Does he need a doctor? I'm a doctor, the redhead said. But the other man, I recognized his face, maybe from a, po a poster on campus, a faculty member from another college. He'd given a talk recently, but I couldn't recall the subject. 
gently tried to shoo them away. The women stood looking at him, then back at the weeping man. A group of 20-somethings across from me whispered to each other. An older woman I'd seen here often but had never spoken to was looking at her phone, maybe calling 911. A pair of men to my right watched the interaction between the women and the silver-haired man, my colleague, apparently preparing to step in if needed. He's fine, my colleague mouthed when the, when the doctor and, the, and her friend didn't leave. He waved them off again and pointed to an object on the table, a phone, indicating that he was recording the conversation he'd been having with his companion, whose sobs had subsided into, into periodic shudders. The companion drew a handkerchief from inside his blazer, wiped his eyes, mouthed his nose. I recognized his face, too, now, also from a poster, a Japanese pianist visiting for a concert at the School of Music. I decided I'd go to see his performance, though I felt certain nothing on his program would surpass what he'd just produced. Maybe the doctor and her friend were reassured. They backed away. The Japanese set his hands on the table before him, figures splayed. No one else was looking at him anymore. They were disappearing again into the ambient wall in which we'd all existed so peacefully and separately just a few minutes before. Except that now I'd been stricken by that odd tethering effect sometimes produced by less dramatic disturbances, the exclamations of a loud talker, an abrupt shift in a conversation's tone, and I couldn't imagine how I hadn't heard the two men conversing before. Still, I'm not sure I caught everything the Japanese said after this, in part because his English was shaped both by his native tongue and strangely by a distinct Scottish burr. I never found them, I thought he was saying, as he started again, my silver-haired colleague looking on impassive, as if his only role was to listen. But what did it do to provide the other with such a mask-like stony expression without any sign of, of empathy? The Japanese lowered his eyes, swallowed. He sipped some water. That is, he resumed, no one was found. A grid of streets, piles of debris strewn over rice fields, shoals of materials, remains of buildings, fishing boats and cars mixed in with beams and studs, tile, glass, their possessions, all the neighbors of my childhood, people I'd gone to school with, parents like mine grown old, pets, goats, horses, books, all the little things of school classrooms. You asked me to be specific. I it would take jackets and boots, work clothes, dresses, musical instruments, curtains, all the things of life, eyeglasses. My father wore very large plastic. He took another sip of water. I'd intended to go immediately, he said, as if it had been a heart attack, a car accident. We'd already canceled my appearances, but there was Fukushima, the nuclear plant, too, so I waited until a concert brought me to Seoul, and then a friend from Sendai drove me, a businessman who'd been volunteering at a shelter, and he knew nothing about anyone we'd known. There was nothing to know, the whole village out to sea. His face started to collapse, and I thought he'd crack again. I was about to look away, but he let out a long, quiet breath. I hadn't spoken to my parents in almost three weeks, he said. That wasn't unusual. I had no news to tell. I assumed they had none either. I wonder now what made me start recording him with my own phone, and I'm not sure how I feel about taking possession of this thing secretly. I've listened to it many times since, trying to hear it better, the pianist's strange voice faint because of the distance between us. Not far, really, but enough. I didn't go to the concert. It was about this time that another, even louder sound cracked open the afternoon, echoing across the valley, leaving the ground beneath us, our tables, chairs, cups, and glasses shuddering. An explosion, I think most of us on the cafe's patio thought, aware of each other again, looking from one face to another for confirmation or reassurance. Or maybe it was a catastrophic collapse, a historic building on, or one of the many giant cranes downtown erecting new condos in their place. The light had dimmed, as if the event, whatever it was, had knocked us forward a few hours into dusk. Something was occluding the sun, a sphere, dense and dark and quiet up there, mid-sky, hard to see clearly because of the intense glare on its surface, like light reflecting off water, limbing the thing's upper left quadrant, giving it depth, revealing its curved surface, so that you were sure it was an immense sphere, poised above us, 
like a question. Minutes later, continuing its daily traverse, the sun passed behind it, or seemed to, because of the relative distance between us and it, between it and the sun, leaving us on the patio, the neighborhood around us, in a cool shadow. The sun's disappearance seemed to flatten the sphere, making it look more like a black spot or a hole in the sky, an absence, an opportunity, a way out, if you could only get up there. Thanks. Thank you all uh, once again, and I'm going to ask you to applaud for a video that I can send my colleagues who are not here. Thank you.